Thanks for joining today's webinar on the February deep freeze, cascading disasters in an era of climate disruption. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute is Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Today's session is part of our rapid response series to address evolving issues. And after today's webinar, our next event is a conversation with Pat Brown, the founder of Impossible Foods. It's coming on March 11th. In today's webinar, I'm excited to talk with four diverse experts about last week's extreme cold and the cascading disasters across Texas and the South. We'll discuss the causes, the factors that shape the background, and the path forward for decreasing risk in the future. I usually start these webinars with a brief overview to make sure everybody's up to speed with the basics of the issue. I'm sure everybody knows the headlines. Millions of Texans were left without electricity and water, often trapped in freezing homes during the most brutal winter storm in memory. But the event has many dimensions, including policies and infrastructures that, however well-intentioned, made the system more vulnerable to failure under last week's stress. In addition, impacted communities had access to contrasting measures for managing, from being totally isolated on one's own to hopping a flight to Cancun. Today, we'll take a deep dive into understanding the deep freeze. The four panelists for today's conversation are Sarah Fletcher, Catherine Coleman Flowers, Michael Wara, and Arun Majumdar. Sarah Fletcher is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford and a center fellow in the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. She's an expert in adaptive planning in a changing climate. Sarah's core competencies are water systems, engineering, climate science, and risk management. Most of her work focuses on using future learning to manage costs and risk, totally critical for today's topic. Sarah's work demonstrates that designing for flexibility and taking advantage of learning as it occurs can result in dramatic reductions in risks and costs of deployment under some, but not all circumstances. Catherine Coleman Flowers is the founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice which seeks the implementation of best practices to address the reduction of health and economic disparities, improve access to clean air, water, and soil in marginalized rural communities by influencing policy, inspiring innovation, catalyzing relevant research, and amplifying the voices of community leaders. Her journey is chronicled in her new book entitled Waste, One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret. Catherine is a 2020 MacArthur Fellow based on her work as an environmental health advocate. Arun Majumdar is the J. Precourt Provostial Chair Professor at Stanford University, and he recently completed a successful stint as director of the Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy. Prior to joining Stanford, Arun was Vice President for Energy at Google, and before that, he was the founding director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, Energy, and in 2011 and in 2012, Acting Under Secretary of Energy, where he oversaw energy efficiency and renewable energy, electricity delivery and reliability, nuclear energy and fossil energy at the Department of Energy. Arun has been elected to membership in the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Michael War is the director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program and a senior research scholar at the Sanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Michael's legal and policy scholarship focuses on carbon pricing, energy innovation, and regulated industries. One measure of Michael's stature is his membership on the California Commission on Catastrophic Wildfire Cost and Recovery. Prior to joining Woods, Michael was an associate professor at the Stanford Law School and an associate in Holland and Knight's government practice. The format for today's conversation is that I'll start with a few questions. After about 20 minutes or so, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. To get a question into the queue, type it in and any time to the Q&A box using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can, and after the webinar, we'll draft answers to any unanswered questions and post them on the Woods website. Let me start with a question for Arun. We keep hearing that Texas had a special electricity system. Can you just describe some of the features of it and 
why they picked the ones they did and what made it vulnerable. Well, first of all, Chris, thank you for putting this panel together and I appreciate the invitation. It's great to be with all the panelists out here. Um, yeah, so Texas has a special grid different from many other grids since you're, you know, since we live in California, our grid is connected to many other states in a substantial way. And we can exchange electricity also in terms of capacity quite a bit. Um, the Texas grid, which is managed by uh, Electricity Reliability Council of Texas called ERCOT, is fairly isolated. It, it's, it, it is regulated by Texas itself, not by the federal government because of its isolation. And it is connected to, it is connected by high voltage DC lines to uh, north, it's about 800 megawatts, whereas it is connected to Texas, uh, sorry, connected to Mexico uh, with a few hundred megawatts. Uh, some of it was available, some of it was not available, but it's really a, like a small fraction, about 2% roughly of the total grid capacity of Texas. And so, and it is, um, and uh, so that was part of it. This, so when the demand went high because of the freeze and so the supply went up, whether it's um, the natural gas supply or a nuclear plant went offline, some of the wind turbines were not weatherized, they went offline, you had a gap of around roughly, I'm giving order of magnitude about 10 gigawatts or so. And of course the tie lines were not enough to provide that electricity. So you had to have rolling blackouts. And in fact, ERCOT almost got to the point that it was a complete you know, collapse of the whole system. So that's just on the electricity side. Of course, ramifications of that, there's gas shortage as well because the Midwest had demanded gas as well because the cold wave was not just in Texas and had implications on the water. And the rolling blackouts, of course, were that were instituted as a way to manage the supply and demand had issues. And I'm, I would really delighted to hear about, I'm looking forward to hear about the environmental justice issues about the communities that were indiscriminately disconnected and without paying attention to those issues. And um, so, so that was really what, what happened. There's a, a lot of finger pointing going on, but the key issue is that if you're isolated like that, and you don't have reserves in place, and if you don't weatherize, these kinds of things uh, will happen. And we can go more into detail of that, but sort of that's a high level issue. Great, that's that's super useful. And to to switch to the context in which this occurs, Catherine, maybe you could comment on kind of the general nature of communities' um, stature and vulnerability to something like an electricity shutdown. And what are the different kinds of resources that different communities have for coping? Well, first of all, Chris, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. And uh, I'm glad that it also include trying to uplift stories and, and voices of people that are most vulnerable in these situations. I think what we saw in Texas is just a, uh, a forerunner to the climate um, catastrophes that have been happening in environmental justice communities for a very long time. Because environmental justice communities generally do not have access to the type of infrastructure that one would expect in, in, in more affluent communities. Uh, in addition to that, um, a lot of those communities were, were already coping with COVID and it put them in a situation where they are far more vulnerable than probably anybody else. And when I looked at uh, the stats on people that were impacted in Texas, I was not surprised to find that it was the low income communities, it was those frontline communities that lived near those chemical plants that went offline that were impacted the most. And I'm sure, although we haven't seen the stats on it yet, that the rural communities were impacted as well. So I think that what, we, what we're seeing is the failure of infrastructure that is not prepared to deal with climate change. And then we also have those areas that never got the proper infrastructure, they got the cheap infrastructure, nothing that's sustainable. And as a result, uh, those communities were impacted as well. So what we saw in Texas was just a combination of all these things coming together. And I, uh, I had friends that were sending me messages. One friend sent me pictures from 
San Antonio of the snow cover that was on the ground. He wanted me to emphasize that they couldn't use their toilets. He said, although they had, they still had power in the part of San Antonio where he was, he said, Catherine, I can't flush the toilet. And I started asking people that were reaching out to me about that, that that was the case. And then we found that those communities that were food deserts in the first place before this catastrophe still couldn't get food because food is, for those of us that were not in Texas, but I just know I live in Alabama and if there's even a hint of a half an inch of snow, everything is gone off the shelves in the store. Well, those communities that don't have the grocery stores, don't have access to the foods, uh, were even more left behind because someone sent me a picture of a grocery store at a Target and it was cleaned out, literally. <clears throat> so those communities were, it's just compounded problems that have always been there. And what we have to do is we think forward about climate change and climate justice is how do we first of all address those communities that have been left behind and, and make sure that they have access to when we do think about what the grid should look like when we think about who should have access to renewable energy and who shouldn't uh, but make sure those communities are at the front of the line instead of as they have always been at the at the, the back of the line or not in line at all thank yeah thanks so much this this question of building resilience has has so many dimensions, some of which relate to the uh, coping capacity within communities, some relate to the coping capacity within the electricity system. Let me turn to Sarah to ask about how to think about building resilience in a system that is exposed to an unprecedented kind of shock. We know that the cold snap was historically severe and the cascade of events and some events has components that were built in and others that weren't and and when we think about building resilience to highly unusual events you know, what are the kinds of tools we should use and what are the kinds of i don't know insurance policies we should be building in yeah absolutely so i think um, both Arun and, and Catherine have highlighted the, the two really important interacting components of this is that the impact of these crises on actual communities is a function of both the infrastructure system itself and how, how that infrastructure is, is being reliable um, or not reliable, and also the extent to which communities have the uh, capacity and, and ability to weather the storm, as it were. And so our, our planning for this really has to be integrated together. And so we, we can, of course, and, and we should uh, weatherize our infrastructure systems and, and we can you know, remember the fact that the infrastructure that we have today uh, wasn't built for the climate that, that we see today, but now it's being asked to perform in, in dramatically different uh, climates than we have. And so we need to think about what are the, what are the aspects that we can weather and um, really retrofit in order to be more resilient to the new climate extremes that we're facing. And we should really target the components of our system that, that are most critical, the critical bottlenecks that if they fail, then the whole system is going to collapse and, and lead to these, um, these cascading failures. But we also can't stop at looking at reliability from the infrastructure alone. And, and this is because as the climate is changing, the amount of variability that, that we're seeing is just becoming more and more pronounced. And so we can, we can no longer rely on projections like say the 100 year flood um, to, to base our, our estimates on. And so we have to be prepared for the fact that at some point, um, despite the weatherizations and, and the retrofits that, that we will make, that our grid will fail. And so we need to then think about um, resilience from a more bottom up perspective from the communities and think about, well, what are the specific causes that could lead to infrastructure failure? And for each of those causes, so like an extreme cold event, what are all the ways in which that um, severe event is going to impact uh, not only the electricity grid, but also the water sector, also transportation, also the communities themselves, you know, are homes weatherized? Do people have access to transportation to get food? Um, do we have a, a plan for outreach to our communities, including vulnerable populations like the homeless community? Uh, do we have warming shelters? And make sure that we're doing all of this planning together in an integrated way um, across all of the, the relevant uh, planners and regulators. I definitely want to swing back to this 
concept of building resilience, both in the energy system and in the, the communities. But before we do that, I'd, I'd like to get a little deeper understanding of, of what the Texas electricity system was sort of trying to accomplish with the kind of setup it had, and particularly with the kind of pricing mechanisms and the independence. Michael, can you help us get a little better picture of, of what they were trying to accomplish? The Texas market is has always been um, relatively unique, and, and part of the reason that Texas, as Arun mentioned, has kept itself isolated from federal regulation is to maintain that uniqueness. It's, it's very committed to the idea that high enough energy prices will produce, will incentivize actors to produce the resources for the grid that the grid needs to stay online. And in this case, I think what we saw was a cascading system of failures where that electricity system, because it interacts with other systems, in particular, the, the gas system in Texas, which also had a major failure where wells froze in, lots of pipeline infrastructure, compressor stations were not working properly, um, you know, because of those interactions could not uh, achieve the reliability that was expected of it. And, and of course then, you know, this because the electricity system as, as uh, Professor Fletcher mentioned, um, interacts with um, many other systems that we really depend on, particularly in extreme weather for survival. Uh, you know, the, the, there was a cascading series of failures, but, but the core is a real uh, almost uh, ideological commitment to the idea of free markets and a reluctance to impose um, regulatory mandates, a preference for using price signals rather than sort of planning mandates as a way to operate the electric power system. And I think many in Texas are uh, at least at a minimum reevaluating this uh, commitment, um, but it remains to be seen what changes will occur as a result. Great. Yeah. Um, Arun, you, you spoke to the limited amount of interconnects that were available and also to the components of the electricity system that failed. Are, are these all technical things that could be addressed in a relatively short, straightforward way? Or does the system have, have deep vulnerabilities that are really hard to address? I think the answer is both. I mean, you if you're isolated and your capacity that you have is 2% of the whole needed capacity, well, you better have some internal reserves. And, and that, that needs to be you know, put in place, that needs to be acted upon. Um, the other thing I would just follow up on my, what Michael said, um, you know, markets are terrific things. So they're very efficient and the market designs are created to really satisfy supply and demand and you need to balance the grid in real time. That's, and so markets are trying to solve the equations of physics of supply and demand because you can't store, we don't have much storage. But when you have a cold wave like this, the physics changes. So markets don't always are not designed for that. And so I think when you're talking about emergency issues uh, and you have in place only a market to take care of things, as Sarah was saying, I mean, that, that it doesn't work. So I think the short term things, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of things still coming out, the short term things, and I, I go back to what happened in the United States during the uh, oil embargo in the 1970s. Out of that came out strategic petroleum reserves. And, and you know, and those we can, we can supply the United States with 90 days of oil, should there be a emergency like that. We really need to think in a much deeper way. I mean, that was one solution. We really need to think now, given the climate induced weather extremes that we can have, and we can't exactly predict where we're gonna have them and how deep and intense, we just know that the trend doesn't look good. We need to think just like a, in a simulation game, what would happen in cascading and what are the measures you wanna take with it and how the interconnectivity of infrastructure really creates a cascading effect. And in, in physics terms, it's like a phase transition, you collapse them. And to avoid that, what are the measures you need to take if you do have reserves, 
of heat or some gas or hydrogen, whatever that may be, where do you want to locate them? Where do you want to place them? Do you want to do it centrally? And if so, there are risks associated with that, or do you want to do it in a distributed way? All the discussions that we have had on the grid so far is that, hey, we need storage for the grid, and you want to do it at the substation. We are always thinking about the fluctuations of the intermittency the solar and wind will bring into the grid. So we need storage. This is a different ball game now. If you have, if you have, if you need storage, for example, for weather uh, in weather extremes, that storage is quite different from what we would need for if wind and solar are fluctuating on the grid. So I think we need a really much deeper dive into the in interconnectivity of infrastructure. What would you need? in terms of connectivity of high voltage DC lines so that it's not 2% of the capacity, but much higher capacity. When do markets work and when do they not work? Markets, there are market failures that happen. And in that case, what should be the pricing mechanism? What, how would you distribute the electricity to those communities that will get much more severely affected? Wealthy people have generators in the home, poor people don't. And, and so and how would you address that? So I think it's a much broader, deeper discussion that we need to have. And, and Catherine, the uh, issues that Arun raises are ones where it's really important that we hear from a range of voices. And, and we hear not only from the people who were intimately involved in power system design, but the people in communities who have to deal with whatever the uh, decisions about where you locate storage are and how much storage you have. What have you found to be effective ways to make sure that community voices are heard as the kinds of decisions that need to be made get discussed? Well, there need to be mechanisms put in place where the community voices uh, go beyond the politicians. I think the politicians have a certain narrative that they want to promote. And some of the politicians don't even live in the situations <laughs> that we're talking about. Uh, and we, the assumption is that all black politicians live in EJ communities, that's not true. Uh, some of the black politicians are a little bit more affluent and can afford to live in better situations. We have people in those communities that never get a chance to, to, to lift up their voices. I know in Texas, there's a strong network of environmental justice activists that can be part of any solution any discussions about what the solutions are because they're experiencing the problems firsthand. So I think that's the first step is to make sure that they're part of it. I think it's, it's very, very similar to what, um, what, uh, what happened last summer when I received the call from Senator Bernie Sanders people appointing me to the, to the Biden Unity Task Force on Climate Change. I mean, most of those people that were, were there were people like Gina McCarthy, uh, John Kerry, uh, other people were members of Congress, and I was just a voice from the community. But it was, it, I think that my presence there made it significant because at the center of the climate plan now is environmental justice. So likewise, whether it's in Texas, whether it's in California, whether it's here in Alabama, we have to do the same thing. I think that's a good model to reach out to people in the community that have been doing this work for a long time. Actually, the person who calls himself the father of environmental justice is in Texas. So, and that's Dr. Robert Bullard. Robert Bullard. So, yeah, so we have, Texas has a brain trust of people that are there that could, uh, that potentially could create a, a model for what should, we should be doing in the rest of the country because they certainly know what failure looks like now but they could also be a part of finding out what success looks like as well. Sarah, could you comment on this, uh, the question of, of learning from experience and whether the kind of uh, formal approaches that you've been using help us think about how we would allocate resources between uh, investing in making the system more resilient versus the bottom-up investments in making people more resilient. Absolutely. And giving people the resources to make themselves more resilient. Let me say that better. Absolutely. Right. I mean, building for resilience is just enormously 
expensive in the water sector alone. Some estimates put the, the annual cost of climate adaptation at um, up to $100 billion per year. Um, and so we have to be really uh, strategic about which, which things we invest in and when we invest in them. And so um, one way to think about this on, on the infrastructure side is as, as Arun pointed out, you know, we know the climate is, is changing in, in really dramatic ways, but we don't in any particular place always know exactly what the, the changes are going to be and over what time period they're going to occur. And so we can do some, some, um, some calculus around which infrastructure components are um, going to be, uh, lend themselves to being retrofit uh, to, uh, to new climates as we learn about how the climate is changing over time. So if something is, is easy to change, then that means that we can take a wait and see approach. And, and if it becomes clear that uh, say extreme cold events are becoming more frequent, we can decide to make those upgrades later. Whereas for, for other pieces of infrastructure that we're building that are perhaps difficult to change in the future. So for example, you lay down pipelines and then it's, it's enormously expensive to, to go in and uh, try to weatherize them afterwards. Those are, those are pieces of infrastructure that we might want to just make very robust today uh, to be prepared for a wide range of, of future climates. So being really strategic about what really needs that investment now and then what we can take a wait and see approach um, in the future. And then coupling that with, with um, investments in the communities so that when we have those, uh, those failures that we know will occur, making sure that they don't, you know, they don't have to lead to loss of life. Um, and some of these really severe impacts that we have. And I think that that's also an opportunity to uh, invest in our communities in ways that are, are positive, you know, not only during disasters, but also, also in good times, thinking about say green infrastructure for flood resilience, um, that is gonna be a benefit to, to local communities, um, both in, in good weather and, and bad. Michael, uh, Sarah's just pointed out a, a way to think about prioritizing investments in infrastructure. We also need to make some investments in changing the policies. And, and I'm sure we can be informed by some of the same kinds of, of paradigms, but, but how should we enter this space of the kinds of policy adjustments that can make the whole system more resilient? Well, I'd highlight two issues. Um, one is not just that we need to invest more, but we need to pay careful attention to who pays for that investment. Rates, electricity rates in particular, are an extremely regressive way to pay for infrastructure. They're actually more regressive than sales tax. Um, and we really need to be asking hard questions about whether it makes more sense to pay, to find ways to pay for the needed investments um, in ways that don't penalize low-income households that are just trying to make the monthly bills work and put food on the table for families. That's a big issue here in California with respect to wildfire. It's going to be a big issue with respect to crude resilience in Texas. Um, the other thing I would say, and this relates to what Sarah mentioned at the end of her comment, is that I, I think you know one of the key missing pieces of the Texas policy and market paradigm is a uh, focus on energy efficiency. And that, you know, the Texas buildings, in particular Texas housing, is not terribly energy efficient. And that means that um, uh, in a cold snap, houses get cold really fast. They, they do not um, keep their residents warm and, and so resilient. Um, it also means that in the summertime, air conditioners have to work harder to keep homes comfortable and livable during heat waves, which are actually a much more common um, phenomenon and, and, and driver of high electricity demand in Texas and, and the Southeast generally. So I think, I think there, there are lessons to learn from this about customer resilience and how, how, how residents of communities how, how can be made, um, can be helped to become more resilient to these sort of systemic failures when they do occur. But I also think we need to keep our eye on the distributional impacts of these big infrastructure investments that are being necessary both because we haven't really invested in our infrastructure in the way that we need to over the last half century. And also because as Sarah pointed out, the design basis because of climate change is like a moving target at this point. It, it, it is really important to keep in mind that the, the most efficient places to invest may not be the most obvious ones and things like home weatherization could be super important. 
Catherine, do you want to comment on this the question of who pays and whether the system is is already rigged to uh, disadvantage the, the people who have the least resources? Well, one of the things that we know that some of the decisions have been put in place based on structural racism and redlining. So the communities where people uh, tend to live and that are most vulnerable, they live there because they had no choice because the policies were set up to direct them into those areas. So we have to, we gotta address that and we have to know that the, a lot of these decisions are not made in isolation where people don't bring their biases to the table when they make these policies. And I think we, we see that you know in all EJ communities and we particularly see it in Texas. And I cannot help but think how much the fossil fuel industry had had uh, impact on the kinds of decisions that were made in Texas because at the end of the day, they still won. They may have lost in terms of the power of the system failing, but when I read about people getting $17,000 power bills because of their failures, it makes no sense. It's almost like when the when the banking industry, the finance industry was banking, banking or, or gambling on people, uh, giving them mortgages and then gambling on them uh, foreclosing on the mortgages too. We have to we have to dismantle these failed paradigms that that put profit over people, and that's why we're in the shape that we're in. That's why we had demonstrations throughout the United States last year because we did not look at the impact it was having on people. And likewise with climate change, climate change is going to have an impact on all of us. That's why we're having a discussion about it now. But those communities that have always been impacted by these uh, uh, about the decisions to place plants in areas uh, that have impact on people and they profit from it. They've always profited from it. And until it starts impacting all of us, then nobody else talks about it. But climate change has, has become the great equalizer. And when we sit down to talk about what progress looks like, first of all, let's remove the structural racism and the inequalities that penalize people that are poor and people of color first and foremost. And until we do that, we're gonna always have failures. It's just that all the deaths are gonna be in those communities. Uh, that's such an important message. Uh, Arun, do you wanna comment on, as, as you think about the steps that Texas and the nation should be taking to make the grid more reliable and to address people's needs. Uh, how do we build in a, an appreciation of issues like systemic racism and the fact that uh, the prices are set up in a way that's highly regressive in the current system? Yeah, I mean, this is a, such an important issue. This was one of the main uh, points of the Biden coal campaign was not just about clean energy and, and addressing climate change, but frankly, to connect the climate change and the infrastructure that we need to build to address it to A, to jobs, uh, because that would be a source of growing the economy and also to environmental justice and equity, because we can't leave anyone behind in this transition. There is no question that we have to transition whether it is to mitigate or, or, or reduce our emissions and mitigate and uh, climate change, or not all, and adapt to become more resilient uh, communities. But while this transition is going on, we can't do it the way we have done in the past. We gotta address the, the issues of environmental justice and to create jobs at the same time. And so this is the, I would say connected, the, the dots were connected in the campaign. And this is what we're gonna see hopefully in the next few years is to really address them simultaneously because if you're going to change, you might as well do it the better way, which is what the Build Back Better part of the campaign was. So anyway, so I, I think this is a, in many ways, an opportunity. It is certainly a challenge, but every challenge that is posed by climate change, we have to address. But if you have to address it, you might as well connect the dots and address it the right way. And I think that's what the, the whole administration, and uh, since I was part of the transition team, this issue of climate change, I was responsible for, for looking at DOE, FERC, and Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I can assure you, this issue about environmental justice 
will be elevated to the point that has never been done, in at least in the Department of Energy. It'll be elevated to the point that this will be across the board, as it should be. And, and so this is what we're going to see now. Hopefully, we can they can execute to bring this to actual action. And, and so uh, I think this is a terrific opportunity to address this. But I would also say that we, we spend a lot of time thinking about mitigation, reducing emissions. And frankly, my personal feeling is that we don't spend enough time talking about adaptation and resilience of communities. And I think this is, uh, you know, it's not just Texas. There have been many other, California went through that. And there are many other parts of the world. I mean, environmental justice is not just a domestic issue. It is an international issue. And so there are many other parts of the world that will go through climate catastrophes, just like we've seen this glacier burst in India that happened and then just, you know, brought down a whole electricity system in dams, et cetera. We're gonna see local tipping points that'll happen. And I think this is a time to step back. And I hope this is one of the issues that is discussed in COP26 in Glasgow, that it is not just a mitigation issue. We really need to talk about adaptation and resilience. And while mitigation could be a G7, G8 or G20, adaptation resilience is everyone, the whole world. Yeah, it, it, it is um, incredibly exciting that the administration is focused on it. And I think this kind of conversation has the potential to really en enrich the set of opportunities moving forward. I just want to ask one last question of Arun before we switch to the uh, to the questions from the from the audience. And I wonder if you could comment on the role of renewables and whether there's any traction to the idea that renewables make the system intrinsically less resilient. Well, this is um, this question. A lot of you know discussions have been going on. Look, we have wind turbines in North Dakota. And we have wind turbines in Texas. If the wind turbines are running in North Dakota, they can run in Texas as well. We just have to pay attention to some of the weatherization of the system out there. And so one, and you asked me earlier, what should we do as a short term is to make sure that the energy infrastructure is weatherized, not just the, the homes absolutely needs to be weatherized, but the energy infrastructure and the devices that are there, whether it's solar or wind and all, need to be weatherized so that they can actually operate when you have a cold or a heat wave. So I think those, I, 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 I don't think it is the, uh, it is the renewables. I, I firmly disagree that renewables cause this. Yes, renewables went offline because they were not paid attention to. And so if you pay the attention to that as they have done in other parts of the country, they would be running. So um, I, I dispel the myth that it's the renewables that are causing uh, the, you know, instability in the system. Yeah, great, thank you. So I wanna do transition now to questions from the audience and, and we have a bunch, but please feel free to uh, add a question to the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, let me start with one that's a water systems engineering one for Sarah. This one, question's from Lyle Brecht. In Texas during the power failure, once the power came on, why was the municipal water still unavailable? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and uh, part of it is that it, it takes the water treatment um, systems, which lost power some time, to, to get back online, and you have to get all the pumps running again, and so it just takes some time to be able to get the water distribution system back to its full um, pressurization level, and that's what you really need to have in order to ensure that your drinking water is safe, because when the pressure is not high enough, that allows pathogens to infiltrate the, the water infrastructure and potentially contaminate water supplies. Um, uh, Catherine, let me ask you a question. This one's from Danica, sorry, it's about uh, the electricity bills. There's talk of the government covering the cost of energy bills, which company executives have described as like winning the lottery. If the government covers the costs of the exorbitant energy bills caused by the demand pricing, won't that just disincentivize the population from demanding the um, protections and regulations and upgrades that are needed? I think that's a good question. Uh, I think that we have to have some help for people that don't have uh, access to, to energy. Because as we saw in Texas, a lot of people froze to death. So 
what do we do? Do we sit back and debate it or we make sure that people have access? But I think at the same time, it shows that there needs to be some degree of regulation of, uh, of these energy companies because they have no, in, in that case, they even make that kind of, if they feel that it was um, uh, a windfall for them, then of course, that means that they have no, no humanity and conscience. And that's why we need government to make sure that those kinds of things don't happen because that does not that does not promote the common good. So I believe that we should do both. And often, I think throughout this conversation, we've been talking about either or. But in these communities that have been left behind, they don't have a choice of either or. We're going to have to go back and redo what we haven't done. And the ones that, a lot of the ones I'm sure that are suffering the most that we'll probably be hearing more about in the coming weeks will be those folk who didn't have it in the first place mm -hmm. uh, to pay. And I saw where there was, uh, one instance I read about a person who got that large power bill and because his account was connected to it and he had the money in the account, they took it out. There are a whole lot of people that I know, it would be myself included, if I got a $17,000 power bill, my account would be overdrawn if they had to take it out. So that, and I think that's true of the average, not only Texan, but the average American. Yeah. Therefore, we have to make policy to make sure that it's fair and balanced and humane to everybody. Yeah, let, let's stick with this theme of the electricity prices. And uh, here's, a, here's a question from Michael. This one's from Mark Cronshaw. Can someone explain the very high electricity prices that were mentioned in the news? Sure. So Texas um, employs essentially a, a method called um, you know, scarcity pricing with, for its electricity market and with a maximum allowed price in the market of $9,000 per megawatt hour. And um, essentially what happened is that there was not enough electricity to go around. So prices in the market were bid up to that cap of $9,000. And the idea of the market is that as the prices rise, generators will turn on to provide electricity and that will stabilize prices. The supply will appear to match the demand. But in the context of the crisis that occurred in Texas, no one could turn on because Gas lines were frozen. You know, the, 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 the pressure in the gas transmission system fell in Texas, which meant that generators couldn't use the gas that was available at the plants. A whole bunch of cascading system failures occurred. And in addition, the plants froze, so they couldn't turn on. And as a result, the price just stayed at $9,000 for um, you know, many days. And that's really what drove this creation of this gigantic liability for Texas. And I would just add, you know, there's a small set of customers that have received these really high bills, but a big concern is going to be this sort of giant multi-billion dollar liability and how it's handled in the aftermath. Do all customers end up having to cover that in one way or another? Or do big businesses that, that took risks and maybe were not properly prepared for them have to bear the loss? And that's a big question because you know, it's easy to kind of hide those sorts of charges on an electricity bill, but they matter for people, especially low income people that are struggling to make ends meet and, and pay high energy costs. And so a thing to keep an eye on is not just, you know, that $18,000 bill, but what happens to these big liabilities that have been generated because we hit the price cap in Texas for so long. Super interesting. Uh, let, let's stick with the, the, uh, issue of um, what what controlled the um, the extent to which the the electricity went offline and and uh, this is a question about load shedding for Arun I think from Christopher Chidsey um, do the panelists have suggestions for how to motivate or require more targeted and more equitable load shedding price might be part of the means to better shedding but there should also be some level of an entitlement to a certain level of the resource? And how could we implement better load shedding in order to not have this kind of catastrophic outcome? That's a great question from Chris. Uh, you know, if you think about how the load was shed in Texas, it was based purely on engineering requirements. And as an engineer, uh, I disagree with that. <laughs> I think it needs to be based also not just on engineering, but also on community needs. Of course, we need to provide electricity and energy for our hospitals and the critical in, you know, um, places like that. But 
the communities that, as Catherine pointed out, so so well articulated, so the idea of having communities that do not have a place to go, do not have generators, and their homes are not weatherized. Those communities need more uh, services than the communities that are well to do. So I think there needs to be a, a layer of community needs placed over the engineering needs and then the decision made. And I don't think that was done. And the question is who has the authority in Texas to, to do that, to make those decisions? This is a debate that's gonna happen now. And, <clears throat> and this is a debate that has been brought up by this crisis. It should have happened earlier, but it's also a sign that this debate needs to happen in California and Alabama and all other places because the, these issues are not gonna go away. And I'm not sure there's a best practice in this, but I would love to see much more discussion and dialogue at a national level. These, some of these are state decisions, but there could be an opportunity to do it the right way and to share the best practices across the states because this is not going away. And I, and I really think it's an opportunity to do the right thing now. Uh, that's such an important comment, and uh, it's one I would like to stick with in a, in a question for Catherine. Uh, this one's from Jeffrey Gilman, and it really speaks to the issues that you've raised about the conversations that are going on in the Biden transition team and now in the administration. Uh, please comment on how to go about building a resilient system that makes objectives of minimizing economic disruption and minimizing community disruption uh, equal or even more important footing than building the physical infrastructure. And well, it goes on, I'm thinking specifically about the demand-based electricity rates that have caused extremely high utility bills in the latest cycle. But, but even more important is just to make sure that the voices that are supporting communities are part of the conversation. Yeah, I, this administration has, has mandated, I think through the executive order that was issued uh, last month, uh, that environmental justice be at the center of all of these things. And, and one of the principles of environmental justice is making sure that people that are impacted are sitting at the table. And oftentimes, with that, obviously that didn't happen when they came up with this system in Texas. There were some people that thought that they had come up with something that worked and there were some factors that they did not take into account of. And now they had a chance to be embarrassed in front of the whole world. But I think the way we get to solutions is having uh, opportunities for people in the community. And I'll keep saying that because that's one of the first principles of environmental justice, that the people in the community can speak for themselves and having them sit at the table and be part of the paradigm. You know, my issue is not electricity. I, I work around wood and sanitation. And I see that the people that are developing, and even right now, as we're on this, I'm getting emails from somebody trying to push a system on me that I know will fail in Lyons County. But because I'm in, we're in the news about it, it, they're trying to sell it. These are people that have never been to Lyons County. And likewise, when we, we look at these communities, unfortunately, there are people making policies that impact the entire state of Texas, which is the size of some countries, but they've never been in the communities that have suffered the most if they make the wrong decision. So the, the first step in any of this is going into those communities and finding out who those voices are, lifting them up, letting them be part of sitting down at the table with all of the, the stakeholders, because they're stakeholders too but not bringing them in after they come up with something that may not work and we don't find out till there's a failure, but bringing them in at the very beginning and letting them be part of the process. And, and going back to, to what has been said in, uh, throughout the panel from everyone is that making sure that this happens across the board and maybe out of that could come some best practices. But I think this administration has started and started the process and looking at tools, how we can use uh, to measure equity because that hasn't happened. That also should be done on the state level too. How do we measure equity and how do we plan and design in such a way that also includes justice? Because a lot of times that is not part of the equation. There are a bunch of questions that relate to this issue of holistic planning and um, how we can take next steps in advancing the agenda. There's a question from Bob Bisson. Uh, that, 
specifically for Sarah, you referenced the need for holistic preparedness, not just hardening the grid, but making certain that preparations are in place for dealing with homeless, et cetera. Uh, are you aware of good examples where this is actually being done that we can use as a starting point? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I, on the electricity side, I'll, I'll defer to my, my colleagues who work on electricity systems, but one, one example that comes to mind in, in water um, is here in the state of, of California, we have a lot of experience with droughts and uh, the state of California requires all urban water providers to develop both an urban water management plan, which says you know, here are the water supply sources and this is our, our sort of business as usual plan for ensuring that we're delivering water to, to residents. But then in addition to that, they also require a drought preparedness plan that requires them to say, here's, here's what we're gonna do and, and make sure, here are the ways we're gonna make sure that uh, you know, people are still getting water delivered to their door um, when, when our, our you know, business as usual plan fails. I don't, I don't think that it is doing, um, it has gotten all the way to, to look at especially vulnerable communities. And to Catherine's point, I think there's still a lot of questions around how do we, how do we measure water equity? And the, the state of California also has a, a recent legislation around the human right to water, which, which guarantees that, that all, all residents um, in the state have, have a right to access water. Um, but it's still in, in progress to figure out exactly how to measure that and, and do we even have the, the data to be able to measure that so that we can then move towards incorporating those metrics directly in, in our plan. Would anyone else like to comment on where we are seeing uh, green shoots of, of good steps to address this holistic adaptation planning? <laughs> I wish there were more examples. <laughs> there, there are, but I think but I, I'm I'm also optimistic because the fact that we're having these discussions, this is just one of many discussions that's, that's taking place around the country, and and I think the first step, if we talk about, you know, and I and I, I like to use simple examples to help people understand. But as far as the twelve step program, the first step is acknowledging that you have a problem, and I think we've all gotten to that point. Yeah, we've gotten to step one. We've acknowledged that we we have a problem. And out of that is going to come those solutions. And some of these things we've never dealt with before because we pretended like they didn't exist. But now we're at a point where we cannot pretend anymore because these events are those people that didn't believe in climate change you know, or, or global warming or whatever you want to call it. We have too many examples that have slapped us in the face recently that have said, we have to wake up. It's just like saying COVID was a hoax. And now a lot of us here can, can talk about family members and people that we know who died from COVID. So, it, but it put us in a position that those people in my red state that, that did not believe that COVID was real are the first ones lined up to take the vaccine. So likewise, when we talk about dealing with the infrastructure and planning for climate change and making sure that our grids don't fail, whether it's the, the grids for, uh, or energy or whether it's the water grids because there were failures there too that have, haven't been really highly highlighted in the news as much. This is time for us to come up with solutions because I think people are talking about it. And that's why I'm optimistic. And I think out of this, we're going to say, and we have, a, have an administration that's favorable to seeing uh, the changes that need to happen. And, and apparently a mother nature is voting right along with us because we're at a point now where we don't have a choice. We have to deal with this. There are a whole bunch of questions in the in the Q and A box about um, links to climate change and and uh, whether we know that the Texas event was linked to climate change. I I, I want to pose a question to everybody that 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 sort of turns that around and says um, whether or not it was linked to climate change. How do we think about how much um, extra capacity, how much of an insurance policy we want to build into things that uh, represent kind of, you know, our, our core infrastructure that, that we all depend on. And are there tools we can use to sort of figure out how much to prioritize resiliency as, as opposed to, for example, you know, low costs under typical conditions? And I'd love to hear from it, it, all of you would have insights on this question. Can I take a shot at this, Chris? Um, Please. So, uh, so there's a lot of discussion going on on infrastructure bill, 
in Congress. It's been going on for a while. Nothing much has happened. Hopefully now we will actually see an infrastructure bill. But I think it's important to, to think through how to execute on that and what the bill should contain. If you're digging a hole in the ground or a trench, you might as well think of multiple infrastructures as opposed to one, because you don't want to dig that trench again. Right? That's expensive process. So thinking about the connectivity of infrastructure, um, very important in terms of just building it. Redundancy of the infrastructure, very important. If you are one of the systems fail, um, at least you have another system that can provide that same service. So redundancy of the infrastructure uh, is going to be critically important. And you know, if your electricity fails, at least you have heating <laughs> with gas. And so, and heating is in, in many ways much more fundamental to than uh, than electricity because you don't want to freeze to death. So having the redundancy in the system critically important. When you're building an inf infrastructure, building enough capacity is critically important because if you're building a highway. You and you know this is going to be needed. You're not going to. You should not be building a one-lane highway, but rather a three-lane highway, so that you could use it later on and you give enough capacity. So having enough capacity margin, having multiple infrastructure, having redundancy, is something we should be injecting into the dialogue in Washington. And it's not just in Washington. The infrastructure will be happening in local states and local communities, and they need to be part of this as well. So I think I just wanted to make sure that the infrastructure is thought of is, as Sarah pointed out, in a holistic way with all of these margins and capacity and redundancy in the system. Others want to comment on this question of how we build in sufficient redundancy and resiliency? Sure, I'll, I'll add on and, and maybe a helpful analogy is thinking about insuring your home against, against flooding. Uh, you know, you've got, on the one hand, you could uh, weatherize your home to, to prevent it uh, from, from being destroyed by a flood that, that occurs, but that might be really expensive. And if you were preparing for, say, the, the one in 1,000 year flood, it, it could, uh, uh, you know, multiply the cost of your, your home several times. And so in, an alternative is, is providing insurance for your home such that if, if it does get destroyed by an unlikely uh, but very severe event that you have you have a, a, a good backup option. And so I think we need to think about that with respect to our, our infrastructure in, in deciding how severe of an event, uh, whether it's an extreme cold or extreme heat or, or what have you, like how, how severe of an event are we going to be resilient to? Um, if, for example, the, the cost of um, making our electricity grid resilient to a, a one in uh, 1,000 year heat extreme is going to be uh, more expensive than providing um, warming centers with backup generators in, in every local community, then, then maybe that's not a good option. Then maybe it's, it's um, much more cost effective to, to make sure that we're um, preventing the impacts of the outage on our communities rather than the infrastructure itself. So I think that's, that's one helpful way to think about the trade-off between hardening the infrastructure itself versus um, building resilience in the community. We're pretty much at the end of the hour. Let me close with just a, a couple of thoughts. First, I want to thank all the panelists for some tremendously useful insights. And, and I particularly learned a lot from the holistic framing that it's not just about adjusting the policies, it's not just about adjusting the infrastructure, it's not just about addressing the um, weatherization of people's homes. It's really about um, enabling voices across the spectrum and about uh, taking a systems level view of, of where we have opportunities for intervention and, and where we may not. I also uh, want to thank our technical crew, uh, Justin Warren, Molly Fields, and uh, Athena Sarapio. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you for a, a fabulous set of questions and for the um, recognition that this is exactly the kind of conversation that's going to be able to move us progressively toward solutions that make a difference for people and the planet.
So long, everybody. <laughs>